Manchester, a thriving northern city, once a key player in the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, the intervening years have seen it gradually replacing its looming mills with the modern office block. Cobblestones have given way to tarmac, and the slums that lurked in the Deansgate area have been replaced with elegant structures of steel and glass. But some things don't change and ironically their continual presence leads them to be taken for granted and perhaps then they start to become invisible. The John Rylands Library has stood in the same place on Deansgate for just over 112 years. Inside and out, some of the finest examples of Victorian neo-Gothic architecture can be seen. And yet, a considerable number of the Manchester population don't know what, or even where it is. Is that this one in town, I think, but I don't know. Do you know what John Ryland Library is? No. Um, Any? No, sorry. Is that it? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't know about it. Is it in town somewhere? No. It's um, down on Dean's Gate. The library was named after John Rylands, a cotton manufacturer in the late 19th century. He was one of the UK's first cotton millionaires, uh, originally from St. Helens. He was kind of like Richard Branson of his day, really. He was an innovator. He was the first one to go in the actual manufacturing of linen and then having it in retail outlets. He was a good benefactor to the city of Manchester. Hence, we're sat in this library that we are now. Um, he was good for his workforce, built housing, schools, uh, civic halls, town halls. So when he died in 1888, he left the princely sum of two and a half million pounds to his then wife, Enriqueta Rylands. Enriqueta Augustina was the third wife of John Rylands. He had left no children behind, and so she was the sole benefactor of his fortune. Keen to leave something in John's memory for the people of Manchester, she set about commissioning a new library. So whilst at Oxford, she met with the architect Basil Chambers, who worked in Oxford and Cambridge. And she discussed with him the ideas that she had, and then sometime later, he came back with some drawings. It took him about three and a half weeks. It took the, actually to completion 10 years to build What made it quite unique was, and for its time, it was like the Starship Enterprise. As well as being one of the first public buildings to have electric light, we also had an internal telephone system, a hydraulic lift system, central heating, air conditioning, really state-of-the-art sort of thing. And it was good, in some way, for innovators and inventors with ideas, because they could come to Mrs. Rylands and she would take on their ideas, think about it, if she saw fit, uh, It'll be done. Bookending the main reading room are statues of John and Enriqueta. But the space is lit through the two huge stained windows depicting additional notable figures from their past. However, there were rules as to who could be sculpted in stone and who was painted into the glass. Mrs Rylands is the only female statue in the reading room. Um, around us, we are famous people from the literary world, we have scientists, we have philosophers, we have musicians, we have playwrights. If you could put in the terminology of football, if you're in the Premiership side, you got a statue. Uh, if you're in the First Division, you got put in the window. So once you have a library of this size, the one thing you need is books. So the first collection Mrs. Rylands bought was the Spencer collection, and they were the relatives of Lady Diana Spencer. Um, word came to Mrs. Rylands that their private library, which was one of the best in the country, was going up for sale, potentially going to America. 
Um, so she sent word that she would buy it, made them an offer of around about £150,000. Um, and they snapped her hand off. And that was the first collection to come into the library, which was 40,000 volumes. The library holds what is believed to be one of the largest special collections in the country. Amongst them is a gold-leaved Bible embedded with semi-precious stones and an ivory crucifix. The personal papers of notables such as John Dalton and writer Elizabeth Gaskell and, perhaps most unusually, the largest Qur'an in the world. These are some of the treasures um, that are kept in the library as an example to give you an idea of what we have. In the centre, this book used to belong to the Emperor Napoleon alongside We've got some examples that used to belong to the medieval kings of France. Um, just as a taster, really. These items, 500 year old. Um, I would be extremely impressed if a computer lasted 500 years old. In 1972, the University of Manchester saved the library from financial difficulties by buying it and, in doing so, saved the collections from being separated. The John Rylands Library will be able to hold its wonders for years to come but perhaps it will always be a secret gem of Manchester, hiding in plain sight. It's like one of them, um, like a time-lapse film, really. Because this stays as it is, and all around us all the time, it's changing. <laughs>